Hey folks, this is Jacob Grace, and you're listening to Perennial AF, the Savannah Institute's podcast and blog about perennial agroforestry. Back in December, we held our yearly perennial farm gathering. 500 perennial agriculture enthusiasts joined us online for the 2022 PFG. Maybe you were one of them. We ended the gathering with a keynote presentation by Ricardo Salvador, director of the Union of Concerned Scientists Food and Environment Program. In this episode, we're gonna listen back to Ricardo's presentation. It's gonna be a long episode, but it'll be worth it. Dr. Salvador is a deep thinker who has a lifetime of experience working with scientists, farmers, and policymakers, and navigating the competing priorities that arise among them. For a proper introduction, I'll turn things over to Keith Keeley, Executive Director of the Savannah Institute, who opened the keynote session. Well, hello, everyone. A warm welcome to you all, and, and uh, my thanks to you that, that you're here. It's been a, a really fantastic uh, perennial farm gathering so far, and I couldn't be more delighted that we're capping it off, saving the best for last year to hear from our friend, Dr. Ricardo Salvador. I do wanna take a moment to once again, thank everyone who's made this such a, a remarkable perennial farm gathering from, from my point of view, just the, the exchange the exchanges that we've had here, the connections, it's, it really impresses me just what we can do in a virtual space and just the quality of, of um, people here and what's shared, it, it's, it's really inspiring to me. I wanna once again, um, especially since it's been uh, so successful and remarkably without technical glitch uh, that I've seen of any major form, what, it, what incredible work all the staff and organizers of the, of the gathering have done. So uh, heartfelt thanks for all of those efforts. And I also wanna give a heartfelt thanks to all the presenters. I've just, as I know many of you have been, been blown away with the, the quality of information and a lot of really uh, you know, pardon the pun for working with woodcraft, but cutting edge things here that uh, have, uh, I, I just don't know where else uh, you would be able to learn all the things that that we've uh, b been exposed to here. So many thanks to the presenters from high tech to low tech, large scale to backyard scale and everything in between. It's been really incredible. I know for myself uh, on day one, hearing from voices of uh groups, people who have been marginalized in agriculture and society at large, uh, immigrants, indigenous people, queer communities, and the beginning farmers and bringing up the next generation of land stewards to, to hear and value the perspectives uh, that are oftentimes at the margins and seeing that the real importance and the necessity of bringing the wisdom um, from some of these folks into our work in perennial agriculture, just how important that is. There's also a highlight for me in the, the nutshells in day two to hear folks from communities of faith uh, finding climate justice and earth care springing, uh, springing from their faith and relationships with other people. Um, I was also really inspired um, giving the award uh, for the Deep Roots Award to Dr. Gary Nabhan, who, who among others in the Southwest have highlighted uh, what they called the Radical Center which I, I really think has been exemplified here, where we find strength uh, in, our, in our differences in uniting around our common ground and in the process, connecting with a wider circle of folks and, and all kinds of life forms and places that we have some kind of moral responsibility to and, and joyful connection with. So that, that's been uh, really, really inspiring to me. It's, it's a little bit cliche to say that, but truly a breath of, of fresh air that gives life to all the work that we do. And um, it's also been a highlight for me to, to see all the work with livestock and pastured livestock and the integration of, of animals into perennial agriculture. That's something I've spent a lot of my professional and personal life working on. And um, we've, from the beginning, we've called it the perennial farm gathering and not the tree gathering or the agroforestry gathering because it's been about perennial ecological systems and recognizing there are no ecosystems without animals, as many have said. So um, my thanks once again uh, to all who've made it so special and, um, and, and making it happen. It's a gathering, and so it wouldn't happen without all of us here. 
I, I want to turn now to giving a few reflections on um, introducing Ricardo and, and why we found it meaningful to, to invite him to share a message with us. Um, for one, I, I, this will, I think, become apparent to everyone listening to Dr. Salvador, but it, I want you to know that he really knows farming and he really knows research and that being so core to, to our community, um, someone who's published extensively on corn physiology and agronomy, you know, everyone's been clamoring for more corn scientists to come to the perennial farm gatherings. So <laughs> that's, that's just a joke, but in, in all honesty, uh, just the, the intellectual rigor and the familiar deep familiarity with farming in many forms, uh, is one of the reasons that we've invited Ricardo here to be, um, a presenter at the at the gathering. Uh, you should know that Ricardo was on faculty at the uh, the Iowa State University in the agronomy department, and there are some and helped to uh, launch the sustainable agriculture program there. Of, of which I know there are a number of graduates in attendance here, whom whom I count as close colleagues and friends, and so I'm grateful for that work. Another reason that we've invited Dr. Salvador here is that um, his family connections in Mexico and in, in the United States add so much depth to his perspective on agriculture, past, present, and future. And, and Ricardo has really taken that perspective into his leadership at the Union of Concerned Scientists in their really unique and, and so valuable food and farming program, which under his leadership, if, if you're not familiar with it, has become a real leading voice in how we need to we really must transform agriculture. And part of doing that has been um, really bringing a perspective on the USDA as it's known colloquially as the People's Department and recognizing that for the public interest to be served there, how those public dollars are spent and allocated, uh, we need to be an, an active public in advocating for it. And then on, on a personal note, I just wanna share that Ricardo has been a supporter of Savannah Institute's work since almost the very beginning. And um, I was recalling just the other day with deep appreciation how in 2015 or 2016, um, which in Savannah Institute years is a long time ago, uh, when I was, I was the only staff member, part-time grad student. And, um, and Savannah Institute was really just peddling ideas mostly at that point. And, and, and importantly, starting to build a network of uh, farmers and, and researchers, many of us here today still. Um, but but Ricardo, along with two of his really esteemed staff members coming from DC to Madison, Wisconsin, took, took a whole afternoon with me and went out to visit a couple of farms where we were starting to work. And while Savannah Institute was really just uh, a concept in, in many ways, um, Ricardo really didn't miss a beat in, in wholeheartedly agreeing with us, supporting us, and cheering us on. And that's that was a big confidence builder for me personally, and it has continued to support the Savannah Institute through the years uh, through service on our advisory council as well. So I'm, I'm deeply grateful, and um, I, hope, I hope you'll join me uh, in offering your, your full attention and a warm welcome to Dr. Ricardo Salvador. Thanks so much, Ricardo, for being with us. Thank you very much, Keith. I really appreciate that. Uh, I truly appreciate the invitation to speak with all of you, and I also appreciate that very gracious introduction, uh, Keith. It's very meaningful. Um, both of the things that I just uh, mentioned are special to me because I individually have a big stake in the work that the Savannah Institute is leading, but I also want to make the case that the entire nation has a big stake in the work that you folks are visioning and working busily to implement. And I'll explain more about that in just a little bit. But I want to start out, if you'll um, indulge me, with a few personal stories to connect to the work that you folks are doing and to explain why it is that I mostly can just uh, cheerlead you. As Keith has said, my formal area of study is not what you folks are doing. I have very little to contribute in terms of perennial systems, but I understand well where they fit and how we have made huge historical mistakes in moving away from perenniality 
and how we can reverse a lot of those mistakes by following the lead that you folks are setting. So that's mostly what I want to do. Uh, cheerlead you, encourage you, thank you for the work that you're doing by providing a few vignettes uh, that connect to the historical mistakes that I just mentioned. So what the Savannah Institute is doing, in my understanding, is to lead us in terms of rethinking land use. Agriculture is a use of the landscape. And in particular, the land use of the specific area that we're looking at right here um, has a long uh, history. It long predates the piddly last three centuries uh, where European colonists have been here by thousands of years of uh, stewardship and intensive management. But there are three drivers of the major landscape changes that define uh, what we have had, what we have right now, and what we need to imagine we can have in the future if we're going to do, as Keith has just asked us to do, live on a planet-stable planet. So these three drivers are climate change itself, which, of course, has drivers that are both anthropogenic and also are just intrinsic to the planetary system. The other driver is fire, again, both anthropogenic and naturally caused. And the third driver is drainage, again, with both natural and anthropogenic causes. Uh, the ratio of the natural and anthropogenic uh, dynamics of those three drivers, of course, has changed over the last two or three centuries. And I understand the work of Savannah Institute to be around thinking how those three drivers interact and how the landscape itself needs to be different than the landscape then that we've produced uh, as a result of human activity over the last uh, two centuries on this landmass. So I'll be talking a little bit more specifically about that, but I want to concentrate uh, specifically on a little bit of a story. So I'm going to tell you a story uh, about that. This is what connects me very personally to the to the work that you folks are doing. And uh, I'm very conscious of the fact that it can be easy for all of us to, to lose the thread. And so if the personal stories that I'm about to share bore you, I don't want you to miss the three main points that I want to get to before we're done. So let me just give you what those are to begin with and then go into my stories and see whether they, they actually will help to reinforce them. So I think if you wanna change the future, there are three things that you need to do. The key thing is that you first of all need to be able to imagine it. The second thing is that you need to be able to show that you're doing more than just waving your hands and talking about ideas. You need to manifestly archetype and demonstrate that these ideas are creatable and that they are viable. And then thirdly, we always imagine a different future in the context of what we have at the moment and that th there are always sunk costs in the world that we have at present. So it is not an easy thing to transition from the system that we're in right now with all of the interests that are invested in the system to the system that we imagine. So it is those three things that I wanna end up talking to you about. And I just wanna make clear that that's where we're headed while I tell you a little bit uh, personal story about how I'm connected to your work. So you see in the region of the tall grass prairie here that um, the modern political boundaries define a place called Iowa, uh, named for uh, people of that name, the Iowa, that lived in this area at the time of European contact. And as Keith mentioned to you, uh, the longest I've lived any place, uh, any place on the planet has been Iowa. I'm not from Iowa, but I'm very highly identified with the place. Uh, this is where I married, where we raised our kids, where I lived for nearly 30 years. So a little bit less than half of my lifetime. So I went to Iowa State because I went to study the production of corn. And I wanted to do that because in the place in the world where I grew up, corn was the axis of everything. It was the axis of our diet. It was the axis of our culture. It was the axis of our economy. And I thought that if I could end up at a place like Iowa State University, I would learn everything there 
was to learn about corn, and that's actually what my objective was. I won't bore you with details, but uh, through completely random events, I actually was able to end up at Iowa State University. And I was very fortunate to end up uh, as the graduate student of a, of a professor, now retired, but very important in my life by name of Brent Pierce. And um, Brent Pierce made a deal with me. Uh, I showed up as a, a very undisciplined graduate student. Uh, I wanted to study everything. I had the deep interest that I just described to you. So that meant I wanted to study culture. I wanted to study history. I wanted to study economics. And that was not the curriculum of uh, graduate agronomy at Iowa State University. And so I had a very rough time at the outset. And uh, Dr. Pierce uh, was quite empathetic and he made me this deal. He said to me in one uh, conversation that I'll never forget, okay, here's, here's how we can both be happy. As long as you get A's, as long as you do good in your agronomy, you can do whatever else you want. And so that was a fantastic deal and it worked for both of us. And as a result of that, I was able to take courses that were completely outside of the agronomy curriculum. So let me tell you about one of those courses. I was very interested in where plants came from to begin with, the evolutionary history of plants. You would think that agronomists would have uh, an interest in this question, but at least at Iowa State University, nobody was interested in that in the agronomy department. There was nobody to talk to about that, but right across the street, there was this building. This is Bessie Hall, the botany department. Um, and, uh, I found a course there by someone that everyone recommended to me when I was asking these questions about the evolutionary origin of plants. And um, this uh, professor now no longer with us, unfortunately, by the name of Donald Farrar, offered a course in, in uh, graduate uh, botany, uh, specifically on plant morphology. And so I took this course and I was really a fish out of water. I mean, I didn't have all of the background in uh, plant anatomy and uh, organismal biology that was required in order to understand this graduate level course. But uh, Dr. Farr understood my interests, led me into the course without satisfying the prerequisites and basically just said, you know, it'll be up to you whether you want to ruin your GPA by taking this course. And so I ended up in this course with a number of folks that now have ended up being lifetime friends who were botanists and were part of completely different culture, even though we were right across the street from each other. So here you see uh, the now Dr. Lynn Clark, we were both graduate students at that time, who's one of the world specialists in bamboos. Um, another C4 plant like uh, corn and uh, another one of the very fast growing uh, species that there are out there. Uh, but at the time we were both graduate students and here's how this connects to you you may you may wonder about this story being uh you know self self self-centered but um you are connected to this story because i was the enemy in this class i didn't realize it uh, there's a little bit of passive aggressiveness going on that i didn't understand until we were well into the course and the reason was that in the world of botanists uh possibly everywhere, but definitely at Iowa State University, the natural world that they studied had suffered a calamity in places like Iowa. I mean, there was no place in Iowa where they could go to study the natural environment. It had been obliterated by what agriculturalists had done. And the science that supported and led what agriculturists did was the science that agronomists performed. So if you will, to botanists, agronomists were sort of the high priest of this you know, evil cult that essentially was destroying the natural world, uh, ecology, natural systems, the very things that they studied. And uh, I began to understand this uh, when we took a few field trips to study the very few remnants, say, of prairies uh, in Iowa. Uh, uh, none of Iowa is in, is in prairies, but, but you can find you know, these very small remnants of, of prairies. So we made visits to those prairies. And uh, we made memorable visits to a nearby state park uh, called Ledges State Park. The only places in Iowa which are not under the plow are places that you literally cannot farm, like little nooks like this. You can see this uh, river that for thousands of years uh, has been cutting into this cliff here. 
And under that cliff, if you look very carefully and you know what you're doing, you will find um, bryophytes, uh, you know, essentially uh, cryptophytes, some of the very early uh, land species, non-vascular plants, uh, whereby we can begin to understand what it took to go from uh, algal mats into land-based plants, uh, photosynthesizing organisms that form partnerships with lichens, some of which you can see on this plant uh, or on this cliff. And then from there, the millions of years of evolution into higher flowering plants, with maize being just uh, one of those. So this was one of the things that I told you I was very interested in studying. But when we were out there and we had to go way out of our way, and it was really sad to understand that this was just um, an unwanted piece of agricultural land where it was only because you couldn't get in here and farm that these plants were surviving that I began to understand and empathize with the perspective of these botanists uh, and the destruction that they had seen that agriculture had performed uh, on uh, what was tall grass prairie in Iowa, with about 20% of the state uh, having, having been in uh, forested land. So um, I'm telling you this story because of the fact that um, even though I, I didn't go to Iowa State uh, as the typical graduate student, uh, the typical graduate student would have been somebody that either had a farm background or wanted to perform research to support uh, the industrial agricultural system. That would be the, the prototype of a student that went there. I didn't go there for that reason. So even though I didn't fit in with the typical agronomic student, I did have an epiphany when I mostly spent my time with botanists uh, rather than just with the agronomic crowd. And that had uh, lots of consequences. One of those consequences was that I knew where the very few prairie remnants in Iowa were. This one is up in northwestern Iowa near the border with South Dakota. And uh, much later, when I'd become a faculty member at Iowa State University and work with other faculty members, we put together a course whose premise was uh, basically constructivist learning, the notion that adults learn by experiencing rather than uh, being lectured. To, and we essentially refer to this as boot camp for sustainable agriculture, where for two weeks we essentially just emerged in the culture and the environment of Iowa uh, with no break, uh, basically going from one location to another, trying to interpret what we were seeing. We had a couple of bands, you know, piled about uh, 16 to 18 people into them and went about the state trying to make sense of, of the situation. And one of the first stops, um, I made a point that one of the first stops would be a template of what had existed across the entire state. Uh, so here you see rolling grasslands, uh, you see a little bit of hardwood forest in the background. I thought it was important for people that were studying sustainable agriculture for them to be able to glimpse a little bit of what had existed prior to the establishment of the ostensibly modern, highly efficient food system that they were going to be taught was all around them and that they were going to be taught uh, to make more efficient and to extensify further uh, across the planet because students at Iowa State came from all over the world. So um, one of the other epiphanies that I had in the course of teaching this was that we always looked for people that were from the area to be our guides rather than pretend that uh, because we were coming up from uh, the campus in central Iowa and had fancy degrees that we understood anything about uh, you know domains outside of academia. And when it came to understanding the prairies, uh, the person that everybody recommended to us was the individual that you see on screen here, also sadly no longer with us. She is Maria Pearson, a uh, Lakota uh, native. And um, the reason why I'm sharing this with you was to share with you the epiphany that she gave me, which I think is um, useful for those of us in this group who are dreaming about changing the world. Uh, in addition to helping us uh, with graduate students to understand uh, the biomes of Iowa before European settlement, 
Uh, she also gave us a, a, a mini, mini lesson on Lakota culture, and she made an offhand statement in one of those uh, mini lessons when we went off to the side and I asked her about this comment that she'd made. And the comment was, um, you know, you, you hear this caricature of the native value of making decisions on the basis of seven generations rather than just your current generation. And, and she said, there's very mistaken understanding uh, about that uh, around whites. And she went on, uh, didn't really explain that. So I wanted to unpack that. So I caught her afterwards and asked her about that. And this is what uh, Maria told me. Uh, she said, you know, I can't speak for other groups, but at least I can tell you that in my band, this is the way that I was taught about the seven generations. So you are the center of three generations before you and three generations after you. You're in the middle. So you're in the middle of knowledge that extends back to your parents, your grandparents, your great grandparents. You're in the middle of knowledge that you're going to extend to your children, your grandchildren, your great grandchildren. If you're lucky, all of those seven generations will living will be living at the same time. And you don't get to make decisions on the basis of what is best just for you. You will be informed by what the three generations before you decided, and what they've seen is the result of the things that they decided. And likewise, you will be that person to the three generations that succeed. And that will keep you from making either bad decisions or foolish decisions. You're just the middle generation at any given time looking out on that landscape of time. And I, that has been a very useful perspective for me to keep in mind when uh, speaking big words about making generational change. So I wanted to share those uh, two vignettes before we jump into talking about your work. I hope you see how they actually do relate to the work that you folks do at Savannah Institute. Mm -hmm. And particularly, I wanted to connect that to the fact that both of those insights came from jumping out of the bubble of the row crop system that has very sadly taken over and completely obliterated what existed more than about 260 years ago in the vast area that you folks are now trying to redesign for the future, which in a way is to uh, uh, regenerate some of what existed uh, previously. You're listening to Dr. Ricardo Salvador, Director of the Food and Environment Program at the Union of Concerned Scientists, delivering the keynote presentation at our most recent perennial farm gathering. Who knows, maybe you were even there for the real thing. I've been thinking about this presentation a lot ever since, and we knew right away that we'd want to use it on the podcast. Also, I just like the sound of Ricardo's voice. If he recorded audiobooks, I would totally listen to them. Especially if all the books were about rethinking the dominant agricultural paradigm. Well, at least we have this presentation. This podcast is made possible by the Grassland 2.0 Project, which is working to rethink the dominant agricultural paradigm by transforming Midwest agriculture to perennial agro-ecosystems. Grassland 2.0 believes that caring for ourselves means caring for the land, and that perennial farming methods like managed grazing and agroforestry are our best option for doing so. You can learn more and get involved at grasslandag.org. Now we'll turn things back over to Dr. Ricardo Salvador and his keynote presentation from the 2022 Perennial Farm Gathering. Now, I should warn you, I, I have a vision for what you folks can do that may extend way beyond what you folks are dreaming of. And let me just tell you what it is. I think it all needs to be restored to what it was. I think it can all be restored to what it was. And uh, if you think of the history of the past uh, 260 years as being the uh, march of progress, and you think of all of the gains that have resulted from that march of progress, to hear a claim that we need to reverse that may seem like fighting words. And so there's obviously a lot that I need to uh, explain to you. But I think 
I think we're partners in this. Uh, but since you folks are constrained by what is possible, and I'm always just talking about big ideas, I, I don't have some of those constraints. So I'm happy to share, you know, that imagination with you. So let me just jump right into that with you. So let's talk about the very first item that I mentioned to you, which is that to bring about change, you need to be able to imagine it. And we are always uh, living examples of the truth of that observation. So the world that we're living in right now doesn't just happen to be the world that we were born into. It's the world that our ancestors imagined. The ancestors of many of you uh, in this group actually did imagine the world that I'm, um, uh, I hope, thoughtfully criticizing here. Uh, I mean that in the sense that I understand the motivations of people that gave us the, the present world. Um, so I want to quote to you from one of the folks that imagined what might be in the Midwest. Uh, this is a quotation taken from a diary of one of the settlers uh, far to the east of the area that you're in right now. He was uh, settling the Scioto uh, Plain. Uh, but this is what Mr. Christopher Geist wrote in his diary at that time when he first saw areas such as those prairies that I uh, just mentioned to you. Uh, he said, all the way to this place is fine, rich, level land, well timbered with large walnut, ash, sugar, trees, cherry trees, and etc. It's well watered and it's full of beautiful natural meadows covered with wild rye, bluegrass, and clover. And it abounds with turkeys, deer, elks, and most sorts of game, particularly buffaloes. In short, it wants nothing but cultivation to make it a most delightful country. So uh, we, we need to be very empathetic with people uh, like Christopher Geist. Um, when he looked out across the landscape, one of the things that he and his generation were thinking of was uh, livelihood. Um, you know, the, there were no established systems in the entire infrastructure that we all mostly take for granted these days that provide us our livelihood. Uh, and so what that means is that whereas we might look onto a, a landscape like the one that I've been describing to you and see it as an idyllic uh, environment, people in that generation really did see a blank slate like the one I'm figuring here. And they really did think that they could stamp their imagination onto it to provide abundant livelihood, which they have done. Now, from the standpoint of where we start uh, looking at them, the way that they went about it was to be extractive and consumptive. They would not have seen it that way. They would have seen that, as, as they would have described it, I'm sure God provided a bounty and they were farming God's green earth. So we can be empathetic with them, but I give this to you as an example of the fact that we're living now with an intention that was manifested back in the 1700s in the case of the settlement of the Eastern seaboard of the United States and the immediate Western range of uh, Trans-Appalachia. So let me show you um, the end state of that. So this is just from last week in Iowa. The railroad is not incidental to the harvested cornfield that you're seeing. It's absolutely essential to make work the system that uses the lion's share of the corn that is produced in this region now by way of ethanol plants like you see here. Nor are the plastic tubing for drainage that you see set up for installation during the off season incidental to the story as well. Remember that one of the main drivers of making the landscape transformation that I described to you at the beginning is the drainage. And uh, what these plastic tubes are intended to do is to replace the ceramic tubes that were installed in the late 1800s to the early uh, 1900s in this very same area. So this is an current end state of the system that uh, we can legitimately say Mr. Geist envisioned when he saw sugar and ash and maple and grasslands and imagined that in order to turn that into a truly delightful country, 
that land needed to be brought under cultivation. Well, here we see the endpoint. It is not the ultimate endpoint either. As most of you who live in the area know, there is a literal gold rush to transform the system further into one that is not only highly technological, but one that is highly automated. So the trend of depopulating the area will only be accelerated if these systems do get implemented. And all the signs are that you know uh, investors and large-scale farmers themselves are falling all over themselves to follow this trajectory. And this is the idea that you can combine uh, automated machinery, some of which farmers are already purchasing and putting out into homogenized uh, large-scale row crop land in the form of autonomous uh, tractors and harvesters that are guided by a combination of um, digitized maps and geographical positioning systems. And that are also collecting data as they go in terms of harvest, uh, just to give you one example, uh, which are then layered onto GIS maps of soil types, which are then part of growing uh, large data sets. So the big data of industry, uh, where through artificial intelligence algorithms, the dream is that there will be soon enough information to be able to inform the entire autonomous system about how to farm and how to make decisions down to the inch, as they say, uh, so that things such as seeding, fertilizer rates, pesticide application, all can be predicted and all can be managed by somebody sitting in an office in Chicago or New York City or Singapore, for all that matter. They just need to be connected to the internet and the autonomous machinery in the field, the drones that will be monitoring the fields, uh, all turn agriculture into essentially a video game for somebody. Uh, and the number of people that are required for something like this to occur is quite minimal. They turn from farmers into software engineers, into data analysts, and a number of other specialists. But this system that you see here is actually a vision that some folks are seriously putting out there and working hard to prototype and to implement and to demonstrate in the way that I've said to you is necessary if we're going to transform any system. You folks, I think, have a different vision and are working to prototype a different uh, type of system that you want to see uh, and manifest out on the land. But I'm, I'm walking you through this to give you uh, an example. Uh, and, uh, you know, those of you that live in the Midwest see it around you all the time. So you're, you're very conscious of it. But I'm walking through this to give you an example of how it is very real that we are in a contest of visions and in a contest for the type of systems that we would like to see manifested on the land and that ultimately we are talking about landscape use. So... In terms of visioning, the reason why I'm fairly confident that you folks are about a different thing um, is that I've taken a look at your vision. Uh, you know, as Keith has mentioned, I'm sort of on the outer circle of the operation of the Savannah Institute, get emails from the advisory group. I'm able to, to see what you folks are working on. And I'm reminded of the following. Uh, if, if you're not familiar with it, I can recommend to you a book by John C. Hudson, which is called The Making of the Corn Belt. And uh, one of the most remarkable passages in there after he describes all of the dynamics that led to the establishment of the system that's there right now is this, that the corn belt can be regarded as a landscape expression of a farming mentality. Well, the mentality that you folks are bringing to the landscape is completely different. And so let me just remind you what it is. This is the vision of the Savannah Institute. You're imagining, you know, and that first step that I described about systems transformation, you're imagining a multifunctional agricultural system in the Midwest, which is based on a combination of systems. You have agroforestry, integrated trees, crops and livestock, and the product of that is that you foster ecological resilience, climate stability, economic prosperity, and vibrant communities. That is very different from a statement that most agronomists would give you that would end with making more profit. 
And so uh, this is something that um, you see substantiates what I told you at the very beginning, that when I got drift that you folks were working on something like this, it was really inspirational. And one of the reasons why I'm so invested in you folks being successful and in, in pursuing the goals that you have. But beyond imagining, the next step is to actually prototype and to demonstrate what you folks have in mind and to transform, transform the landscape that the several generations of descendants of Mr. Gist and his cohort in the 1700s have created around you now is quite an undertaking. Uh, you know, that we need to talk about. We'll probably talk most productively about it when we get into uh, discussion. So um, let me talk a little bit about why this is going to be a difficult proposition. You probably all don't need to be informed about that, but I just wanted to score a, a few things about transitioning from the current state. This uh, system, which I'll just generalize broadly, covers a little bit over more than 150 million acres in the center of the country. It is a system that by now is actually a large industrial infrastructure. If you define development as basically transforming from the quote natural state uh, of an environment, then there are surely very few areas of the planet that are as developed as the US agricultural Midwest. It has been completely transformed from what it was. Almost every aspect of the natural dynamics of the area now are either under human control or at least under the pretense of human control. And um, this redounds to massive investment of capital. That system, that vision of autonomous agriculture where there's very little room for people, uh, requires a great amount of investment in technology and industrial infrastructure. And the returns are going to be to that capital, not to people, not to communities. And so those folks have a vested interest in retaining the structure of the system as I've described it to you and as they further imagine entrenching a system like that. Um, it's going to be very difficult to overcome the interests of an industry that if you take the entire food uh, system as a whole is worth $1.8 trillion. You know, that's $1.8 trillion that says things are going to stay the way that they are. And that's $1.8 trillion that translates into massive political power. And so one of the keys to making a transition is to solve problems that people have with the new system that you're proposing and or to force the system that you are imagining through the argument that it is a system that will be better, if not for everyone, at least for those that have political power and therefore can allow the change to happen. So, you know, those are very dire alternatives to pose to you. And, and I know that you folks have been thinking about this because I've seen the sophistication of the strategies that you're adopting, which at least as I see them are more along the end of the spectrum that says, let's provide folks alternatives to the system that is not working for them now by giving them better choices that also will be good for the environment and will be good for the environment. And as long as you're able to do that in niches where nobody is threatened, where you actually are providing uh, farmers and uh, communities and small groups of people a better alternative than the intensive commodity producing system, there will be space for you to grow into. But to think about changing the entirety of the system is a completely different proposition. Now, here is where I need to explain why I think that the change that you folks are beginning to bring about um, and that much larger um, end state that I described to you earlier, which is to completely reverse the last 260 years, uh, converge with each other. So I'm, I'm showing you a map here that was generated by a uh, journalist and data analyst at Bloomberg News a few years ago. And they used a number of government sources to put this together, but the two primary uh, data sources from were from the Bureau of Land Management and from the USDA. 
And as you can see, it is not a literal map, but it is a map that shows you the land area that is devoted to the major uses that we give them in, uh, in modern US society. And this is the modern economic uses that we give. That already is a very filtered view of, of the value of land, but that's what our modern economic perspective has reduced all of us to. So this is the use that we make of the land. So let me give you some round figures about the map that you're seeing here. And again, this I'm not giving you the exact figures, but just for purposes of driving the conversation, let me give you the round figures. About half of the U.S. continental land is used for agricultural purposes. So you can think of it this way, 2 billion acres of land in the continental United States. So half of that, 1 billion acres, is what is devoted to agriculture. And again, about half of that is devoted to pasture and range, which you can see here right in the middle of the map. Here's what I need to remind you. I mean, you all know this, but I just need to state it. This is not literal, just combining the areas. So in the middle of the map, you see what we devote essentially to beef uh, production. It's primarily beef production. So it's cow and pasture range. So, you know, there's about 500 million acres that are devoted to uh, uh, what you might regard to be proper agriculture, combination of lots of different systems. Now, very little of that is actually devoted to food that we actually eat. So, for instance, you can see down there in what would be uh, Georgia and South Carolina in the real world, the area that we dedicate to ethanol and to biodiesel, the combination of corn and soybean. You can see uh, in what would be the black belt of the old, old South, the area that we devote to livestock feed, that would be primarily corn, soybean, sorghum. If you're looking for the amount that we actually devote to food that we eat, contrast this large agricultural footprint here to this small area here, which is the food that we actually eat. So um, here I need to give you a little bit of context. We could produce a whole lot more of the food that we actually eat in the continental United States. We actually uh, import a little bit over half of the food that we eat from other parts of the world. Uh, this is a result of lots of uh, different things. This is not the place uh, where we're gonna get into that, but we could make different choices and produce more of that food here. But the present economy, present history of the agricultural system has led us to the point where if you look at the entire agricultural footprint, the food that we eat is a little bit more than about 8% of that agricultural footprint. Or if you just want to say, well, we shouldn't be comparing against the land that is out in the far west, which is mostly range and is used to, to pasture and to, uh, uh, you know, cow-calf, uh, uh, we should actually just compare against the area that's in proper agriculture, well, then you would just need to double that figure. So a little bit more than 16% of the proper agricultural land is devoted to food that we eat. So think of the fruits, the vegetables, the nut crops, the tubers, and so on. That's what we're talking about here. So I lay this before you to make this really outrageous claim you're one of the few groups that would actually tolerate this without rising up in arms. Like, for instance, I can't see standing up in the middle of the agronomy department at Iowa State and, and you know, be let out alive making the following claim. We do not need the majority of the agricultural land that is in agriculture at the moment to be in agriculture. We can produce food on a very small amount of the total land in the continental United States. We're doing that right now. And as long as we're thinking about what is going to be effective for climate change, um, those of you in this audience probably don't need to have the following explained, so I, I won't go into the details, I'll just make the claim. The majority of the practices that are currently um, proposed to be practices that will stabilize the greenhouse or climate warming characteristics of the U.S. agricultural system really cannot do much with a system that is inherently a climate warming system. And that's primarily the row cropping annual system. Because by definition, that system requires annual disruption, at the very least annual intervention. 
as the sort of intervention that disrupts the surface layer of the soil. It's the sort of intervention that actually harvests at least half of the biomass that's generated and takes it away. And regardless what the use of that is going to be, it's eventually going to be oxidized. The carbon that's contained there is eventually going to be released. And the way that we produce those row crops, we produce one of the two major sources of greenhouse warming gases uh, from agriculture, uh, with number one being the methane that's released from fermentation from the climate agriculture model and the methane that also is given off by the vast manure pits that are uh, also created by that system. But the other major component is the nitrous oxide that is released primarily as a result of over application and intentional mismanagement of nitrogen fertilizers. If you take into account the carbon that is required to manufacture those nitrogen fertilizers, then the climate warming footprint also expands. But the point that I'm trying to make here is simply that that system is the problem. You cannot make it any better by sprinkling cover crops on it or doing you know three or four years of uh, reduced tillage on it and hope that you're going to reverse the inherent characteristic of the system, which is to disrupt the perennial ecosystem that created the carbon-rich template that we've been mining for the last 250 years. So you folks are thinking differently about that. You folks are saying we need to incorporate perennial systems that will give us multiple uses. And it isn't just the perennial systems. The vision statement that I just restated to you accepts that we really need to think of the mosaic of different ecosystems that existed prior to settlement and that was being management by the natives, was being managed by the native stewards of this place as a series of different biomes with different characteristics. So we need to return to that. And that's actually encoded in the vision statement that you folks have. And so that mosaic would include uh, food producing crops. Uh, that mosaic would include perennial crops. It would include woody species. And the point that I'm driving here is that this means that we have a vast opportunity to repurpose a large amount of land, which is currently in agriculture and is not producing food that would be better used for its climate and environmental benefits than the use that we're giving that land now. Now you see why those are fighting words. Because the immediate question that comes to everyone's mind is, well, what about the farmers? What about the people that are on that land right now? Uh, and I want to uh, be clear with you that I'm not unsympathetic uh, to that question, but I'm thinking about reversing several centuries of things that we've not gotten right. This is, applies all over the world, but I'm talking to you about the continental United States right now. And I'm also talking to you about decisions that we can make right now, this generation. Uh, you know, the folks that made their decisions generations ago are no longer here and we can't change the decisions and the consequences of their decisions that they made. But we now live in the 21st century. We now have a better understanding of the way that the planet works. Um, Earth system science tell us that we are contingent beings, that means dependent beings on a series of interconnected ecological cycles, the carbon cycle, the sulfur cycle, the nitrogen cycle, the hydrological cycle. We understand how they're inter interdependent. We understand how we have disrupted many of these systems. We've appropriated the nitrogen cycle. We've completely disrupted climate by disrupting the, the carbon cycle. Um, and with that understanding, if we have an interest in the prospect of humanity, we have a responsibility to utilize that knowledge to change the systems that have given us the ecological disaster in which we're in right now. Rather than attempt to rescue that system and make it slightly less bad, that degree of existential threat to the human prospect on the planet demands completely different thinking. And so here are some of the things that need to be simultaneously reversed. The system that we have at present is the result of an extractive system. That's really the most polite, euf euphemistic way that we can describe to it. 
little bit more accurate is that it, that extraction was exploitation of both nature and people, displacement of people, enslavement of people, which should not sound odd juxtaposed to the environmental case that I've been making. That exploitation of people was just as necessary as the environmental exploitation that I've been detailing, and we need to reverse both. And so let me give you an example of how these things could be handled in a sympathetic, empathetic way. Um, first of all, the majority of us now live in urban regions. Um, we all can understand the case for public investment in producing the food that we eat. One of the reasons why the government has intervened in the agricultural and food system to begin with is that it's clear that the market doesn't work in agricultural systems. This is a very deep uh, topic. Uh, I'll just say that the original Farm Bill came into being because it was clear that it was beyond the realm of possibility that farmers could work together to create the time, the type of supply and demand uh, response that normally would govern the economics of any industrial sector. Because if you think about it, what supply and demand dynamics mean in agriculture are that the signal to farmers to produce less would be that you have a boom cycle where there is abundance. And they would have to make the conscious decision that they would produce less and earn less in order for that signal to be effective. And the converse is just as true. For the signal to produce more, you would need to have lack of food, in other words, hunger, in order for farmers to receive the signal, well, we need to produce more, send it into the processing sector so that then eaters can have more food. That sort of boom and bust cycle farmers have been dealing with, but eaters by and large have been spared that boom and bust cycle in the industrial era, meaning the era where the majority of us are not producing our own food because of intervention by governments in industrial economies. So um, the fact that farmers could not work together in order to be able to manage the government uh, or the supply and demand cycles that way is one of the reasons why we have government uh, intervention. Just one of the reasons, there are many other uh, reasons. But think about the different shapes that that government intervention has taken from the very beginning of the history of this country. One of the shapes was basically appropriating land and distributing it among a certain segment of the population. Another one of the ways in which this happened was to invest in the economic well-being of that very narrow sliver of the population, with results that today there are among, on average, some of the families in the United States that have the highest wealth. Now, they will tell you their, their wealth is in their land but they still have the highest net wealth among, uh, uh, far, or among families in the United States. Now, I told you that I wasn't unsympathetic to their case. If we're gonna repurpose this land, as long as the US government played a role in appropriating it and redistributing it, then it has a role in making things right because there's a public interest in climate stability and, uh, we have millions of acres that could be returned to perennial vegetation that actually could stabilize the environment. Because I'll repeat, we now know more about the way that the planet works. That leads to all kinds of ripple questions. So uh, let me try to answer the ones that are in the back of your head and probably making you exasperated. So does this mean we're just going to displace farm families? That would be piling one injustice upon generations of injustices. So no, that's not a viable. Uh, recommendation. But there is a huge problem uh, in farm country that almost, uh, if you come from a farm family, you are immediately touched by this. It's the problem of farm succession. Because this system only works for about 11% of farm families. That number, by the way, is the number that actually are able to make a living from their farm income. That's how I'm defining that. And the rest actually need to depend on government support in order to make a living. This, this creates all kinds of problems. For many farm families in the Midwest, there is a serious conversation around whether 
it's viable to continue to pass that land on within the family, the way that many of these families brag that they have done, you know, for six or seven generations now. So one of the things that these families really care about is that, that is, as I've just said, where their wealth is, it is their retirement fund. Many of these families actually do have the values that they do not want that land to be sold to investors uh, such as Mr. Gates or other investors, whether they be in the United States or outside of the United States and put into the kind of agricultural vision, that autonomous vision that I described to you, which is a moneymaker for capitalists, venture capitalists. And they also have the values that they would prefer if they had anything to say about it, that that land not be consolidated into the next 10,000 acre farm that's producing grain for ethanol and for CAFOs. But what alternatives do they have? One alternative could very realistically be that if they could receive fair market value for that land that we as a public agreed to provide because of the climate benefit, the environmental benefit, and the socioeconomic benefit of basically returning it to perennial vegetation, we could justify. And this is where I would go further. I'm uh, thinking of how this land was acquired to begin with. And as long as we're reversing things, the many things that we could put right again. The Native American population in spite of all of the efforts to completely disappear them, did not completely disappear. They are still here. We at UCS are working on a project right now with the Iowa, the uh, Kansas and Nebraska band of Iowa, who were displaced from Iowa, and as their name tells you, are in the bordering states, um, on an agroforestry project where they are doing their best to learn how on land that was returned to them by the Nature Conservancy, they can do a combination of things to return some of that land to its original state, while at the same time recovering their foodways, meaning the gathering of their food from that original ecosystem, while at the same time recognizing we all live in the 21st century and saying we're in the middle of Omaha, Lincoln, Kansas City, Des Moines, what if we could entice people to come and visit and learn about what these ecosystems look like before the modern agricultural systems were imposed? And what if we could help them to bathe in that sort of environment for learning purposes, for healing purposes, that would be another stream of income for us. This is a legitimate way for them to think and a legitimate business for them to develop. And so they're thinking in the multifunctional way that you folks are thinking and we're cooperating uh, with them. They're definitely taking the lead, but we're cooperating and learning a great deal about the work that they're doing. So they're doing this on just a, a small, just in terms of the historical uh, landscape, a pathetic sliver of land that was rematriated to them by the Nature Conservancy and which the Nature Conservancy rematriated with an easement, asking for a guarantee that that land never be put into agricultural purposes. So you can see all of these things linking to one another. We could do that at a very large scale and not just think about how we can use this land to make it better for the white people that have gotten themselves into a climate emergency, but rematriated to the descendants of the folks that were displaced from their land. This is one good. There's the environmental good, the climate change good. And as long as we're going to be doing that, then we do need to ask the question, so who's going to be producing our food? I started uh, this uh, riff by telling you the majority of us live in cities. And it would be best, as we learned during the pandemic, if the stuff that we actually eat were produced in resilient systems that were close to where the most of us actually live. So around the population centers. And remember, for this argument to make sense, as any Midwestern farmer will tell you when you ask them why they don't produce food, it's because you don't need a whole lot of land to produce the food that saturates local demand for food. And so that means that there is room in urban, peri-urban, exurban environments for lots of new entry farmers to be set up 
in the way that we set up the folks who homestead it throughout the Midwest largely and in portions of the South with the farming systems that they've uh, developed over uh, five, six, seven generations, we could set up people that produce stuff that we actually eat, stuff that we actually can be justified in investing in. Um, so in this scheme, if it were to develop, you can see how we could pay fair market value to folks that agree that the uses that I just described to you are uses that would be better than going into consolidated industrial production for the economic benefit of venture capitalists. Um, and you can see how it would make sense as those generations become lawyers and teachers and go into other pursuits, that, that opens the door for folks from urban environments who have the interests in learning about producing food to be welcomed into that set of enterprises. And the folks that live in cities look very different than the folks that live in the rural environment for historical reasons that are at the core of the narrative that I'm reviewing for you. So this means that the farmers of the future could look very different than the farmers that we have right now. And that's what needs to happen. So these things could be coupled uh, with one another in a way that makes sense. Who does this leave out? The folks that are producing those industrial crops that you see in the different areas of this map. And for folks who wish to continue to do that, I believe in freedom. Um, all of you do as well. I don't believe that people should be prevented from doing the things that they want to be doing. I just don't see a case for the government to be supporting them to do that. There is no case for doing that. The only case that there is, is uh, a, um, a phantom, a zombie case. It is the belief that if you're supporting that, it dates back to the colonial principle that you're supporting the agrarian economy and agrarian livelihood and agrarian families. But those communities, those families have long ago disappeared, as all of you know. The modern farm is essentially a uh, suburban tract that is isolated in the middle of hundreds of acres of row crop land. Uh, when we're directing millions of dollars into that agricultural system, it is millions of dollars that are going into the folks that are selling to those farmers to farm in the way that they do. It's money that eventually ends up in the hands of Syngenta, Bayer, all the companies that you're familiar with that generate the, the inputs. They should continue to operate that system if they want to do that, but without government support to prop them up, which is the system that we have right now. They should exist in the market. So, uh, you know, that will create its own supply and demand signals that are very different from the distorted uh, signals that they receive right now, which are basically anything can go wrong with the market or with the natural environment, and we, the public, will make you whole. So that is the system that needs to change. Uh, it, it has created all kinds of distorted signals uh, that have created the crisis that we're in the middle of. We're listening back to Ricardo Salvador's keynote presentation that closed out the 2022 Perennial Farm Gathering. Here on Perennial AF, the Savannah Institute's podcast and blog about perennial agroforestry. For the last segment of this episode, we'll hear Ricardo Salvador dig into a big topic coming up this year, the Farm Bill. We'll hear what he sees as opportunities for making positive change and what realities we have to face about working within an entrenched system. Let me talk to you about some of the real obstacles that you know are in the way. And these are the political obstacles that I foreshadowed when I first introduced this. I'm showing you for comparison, one of the most powerful lobbies that exists at the moment. So I uh, collected these data. You, you can do this anytime by going to the uh, Open Sunshine uh, Foundation. And uh, as of the end of last month, the Department of Defense had been lobbied for a little bit over $91 million. A larger lobby than that is the agricultural lobby, which you see here 
at the same time had already lobbied for a little bit over $124 million. And you know that that lobbying is going to be very intense the following year, 2023, which is going to be a farm bill year. This is a lot of political power to try to overcome, particularly since very few people actually have an interest in uh, agricultural policy. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about the political economy of one of the major vehicles that there is to either reinforce or to change the structure of the agricultural system. You all know it. Uh, I've mentioned that this is uh, coming up as the Farm Bill. Um, it is uh, such, a, such a broad uh, piece of omnibus legislation that you really struggle to characterize what it does. It, it, by definition, does a lot of things. So there are a lot of things that are quite beneficial to all of us that are in this meeting right now that are budgeted in that farm bill. Uh, but by and large, what this system is entrenched, what this bill does is entrench the system that we're trying to change. Um, so all of you know that this is billions of dollars a, a year, you know, uh, about $428 billion as the Congressional Budget Office scores it over five years. If you take those figures, which are for the current Farm Bill, the 2018 Farm Bill, and you break them down to the annual cost per individual taxpayer, here's what they are. For the total Farm Bill, it's $628 per individual taxpaying household. Now, you all know that the Farm Bill is mostly SNAP. So if you break out from that, the agricultural side, the farm side, is just $141. The reason why this matters is that taxpayers would look at the Farm Bill in a completely different way than Bayer, Syngenta, Walmart, Cargill, all of the folks that are invested in the structure of the current system would look at it. To them, it's very clear what the outcomes are of investing $500,000 dollars one million dollars or the largest single uh lobbying uh investment 10 million dollars from a single firm it's very clear to them what the return on their investment is for that lobbying it's billions of dollars worth of profit it could be a title or a program within the title of the farm bill but they know exactly what they're getting so that means that they're motivated to organize around their particular political objective the majority of taxpayers in the country, first of all, do not know that a farm bill exists, actually do not know that a food system exists, much less that a farm bill exists. And when you explain to them, you know, in as fevered a way as you can, how important it is and how it touches every aspect of their lives, when it turns out that if you divide the cost that I just described to you down to the daily cost to them, uh, the farm side cost of this thing is far less than the cost of cheap coffee, you know, at, at Casey's, uh, you know, that people would spend without thinking about it. It is very difficult to organize folks around a cost that is so diffuse for benefits that are likewise so diffuse that this presents the major obstacle that there is around organizing for the Farm Bill against the massive incentive that there is for organizing for the Farm Bill on the part of the industrial agricultural sector. So does this mean that we all throw up our hands and say there's no way that we can overcome this? So I wanted to share with you, just taking uh, a, you know, a flagrant advantage of the fact that um, Keith has made a mistake and asked me to speak to all of you, to let you know that we are actually working on a strategy to try to overcome uh, this quandary. And for purposes of this group, I'll just basically summarize it by saying we need to bring a much broader coalition to the Farm Bill than has ever been engaged in the Farm Bill before. This is a lot of organizing work behind the scenes, but in essence, the outcome should be that it should no longer be possible for a very small number of people and a very small number of interests to make the decisions about the Farm Bill that the rest of us pay for. We should work to make sure that it's clear that there are folks that are taking advantage of the system that way, that there's outright grift, there's outright graft, and that they get away with it, or systems that exploit people 
exploit nature, destabilize the climate, pollute the environment. So that strategy, I'll just uh, leave you with the teaser, is something that uh, we at UCS and as of now, uh, 170 other organizations have endorsed and that we're going to be concentrated on pursuing over the next year. Um, if you have interest, uh, you know, you all know how to get a hold of us or any of our 170 partners to talk about how this is going to work. But one thing I'm really clear on is that for us to make any sense when we talk about how we should make different investments to create a different structure, because we imagine a totally different food system in the future, we cannot be taken seriously unless there are people like you that are on the ground developing the systems that are already doing the things that we say the systems of the future should be able to do. So now you see why I've said, and I'm not exaggerating, that I'm really invested in what you folks are doing. I really need for you folks to be successful. Even though I don't understand the practice, I don't understand the science the way that you folks do, I truly believe in what you folks are doing and want you to be successful. And thank you for that. And so thank you for the the time and the grace to uh, uh, put up with a 90-minute harangue. Thank you, Ricardo. Um, and I hope you can hear the the thunderous applause over the, the Zoom channels. Um, I'm hopeful that we have some time here for for questions as we grapple with some of the ideas that you've set on the table here. What, what's some of your reflections on how the land grant institutions themselves, the people deep within them, the people who exist in some sort of relationship with them, how the, um, the institution might be, you know, put to work towards some of these realities and visions that you've put before us? Yeah, that, that is a very good question because uh, almost everyone that ends up working in agriculture goes through the meat grinder of a land grant system or has to interact with a land grant system. Um, so uh, let me tell you that I, I think that the land grant system is a captured system. That's one of the biggest difficulties of working within the structure of the land grant system, but I don't think that it's hopeless. So let me uh, put it this way. Um, Almost everyone that goes through the land grant uh, system, they all uh, either came to the system and leave with a worldview that is intact, or else they're indoctrinated to a worldview that can very easily be reduced to, you know, what my professors would hammer into me is all about the jingle in your pocket. You know, that's what we're aiming for. That's the ultimate indicator. So um, it's it's very difficult to break into uh, uh, that worldview. But the reason why I think that there is hope is that um, all organizations are made up of people. Uh, and uh, um, individuals do make a difference. And the places where there's the greatest chance for individuals with a different vision to make a difference are actually on the margins they're touching but they're on the margins of this industrial system so let me get it really concrete here's a big thing that we learned when we visited land-grant universities we could not even get a hearing for that argument in states where the industrial agriculture was essentially the homogenous monocrop system and the reason for that is easy to understand within each one of those states within the political boundaries of those state and the closed system of the politics of that state you had a very parochial system. The agricultural interests were represented by the State Farm Bureau. Uh, they were close, close uh, hand in hand with the agricultural industry. They referred to themselves as American agriculture. You know, they appropriated to themselves the entire identity of, of agriculture. And they either themselves were the state representatives in the legislature or had close connections with those folks. So they were a close loop. They had a feedback loop to the land grant university that was very simple to parody. It was essentially anything that you do that we perceive undermines our interests, we can cut off your budget. You know, I just took a phone call, phone call to the dean of the university. I saw this headline. If you continue down that road, guess what's going to happen to your budget? It was a very simple system to grok. 
So in those states, I mean, you can imagine, it was Iowa, it was Kansas, it was Nebraska, a delegation from UCS was just not welcome. Uh, persona non grata, the very definition of it. However, there are states where the power of the agricultural industry is not as large for a number of different reasons. Let me give you uh, two or three examples. The three best examples are Minnesota, Wisconsin, Ohio that we discovered on this trip. The agricultural system is much more diverse, meaning that the power of the agricultural industry is not so consolidated over the state house. The state house has many more constituents and many more interests that they need to be uh, responsive to rather than just the monolithic, all-powerful hand of big agriculture. So in those states, we got a whole lot more traction. Uh, and the reason was, you know, let me just quote um, a dean, uh, no longer the dean uh, at uh, Ohio State University. So, uh, you know, I'm not not, uh, not outing anybody. But when I asked the, the dean there why he was so receptive when we've, we'd have we had so many contrary experiences elsewhere, he essentially just told me what I just told you, but, but you know, tailored to his state. He said, well, you know, here in Ohio, you know, we do have a strong agricultural economy. It's primarily northwestern Ohio where they're trying to pretend like they're Iowa. But, you know, we have nine major uh, urban areas in the state. We have a lot of environmental advocates uh, that want us to do things differently at Ohio State. We have a lot of folks that advocate for urban uh, development. We have a lot of different interests. As a matter of fact, the agriculture folks are mostly a uh, uh, pain in my rear. He used different words. But he said, they're just a pain in my rear. They were just here last week. They were telling me that they were expecting that Ohio State should be able to help them with the publicity around the fact that there was this major crisis in Lake Erie uh, over hypoxia that was created essentially by CAFO effluent and, and uh, you know, mismanagement of nitrogen fertilizer. The story of the larger Midwest, but in Lake Erie, you know, there was a, an emergency. And, you know, this dean felt so secure that he said, I told them, you know, if you folks weren't creating these messes, you wouldn't need us to help clean them up. So, you know, that's not the way that most agriculture deans speak to their Farm Bureau constituents. So there, there is an example of, you know, it's parochial politics, but there is an example of how these feedback loops work at the state level. Similar thing operated in Wisconsin. There it wasn't so much because there were these large urban concentrations, but just because the 10,000 acre farm has never been a viable thing. And the mosaic of farms in Wisconsin is of much smaller, genuinely, uh, family farms. And so that that leads not only this state, its legislature and its college to think in completely different ways and to be responsive to, to different types of agricultural systems and so on. So there are people, uh, individuals, you know, many I see on the list of people participating here at these different land grant universities that as they become senior researchers, that as they become department heads, that as they become deans, can make a difference. They can lead in a completely different direction, can open up um, different uh, perspectives with a lot of arguments that can be tied to the self-interest of the land grant. If the land grant uh, is going to survive in the future, the formula funding that was tied to a number of farmers that were in the state and the fact that they eventually will be shown up to be responding to a very small sector of the economy rather than to the numerical majority of the demographics of agricultural states, that will catch up with them. So I have hope that there's opportunity for uh, you know folks like you and those land grants in the periphery to be the vanguard that will eventually take over. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's something of an article of faith to believe that our public institutions can track towards being more public and the public interest that they serve. But uh, it's good that you have experiential uh, evidence to, to track that that can be the case as well. Um, you know, we can put out a vision and we can work towards it, but coordinating transitions in a just and sensible way is a very difficult thing to achieve. Um, so uh, what, what would you reflect in terms of what that land use change and land reform path might look like for us, and especially yeah. in a global context? Yeah, I, I actually, uh, first of all, let me say it, it, it is difficult because of uh, essentially we're we're talking about uh, an interconnected mesh of an economic system, a political system and a worldview that essentially lands on the sanctity of private property. Um, 
On the other hand, there are some balancing points here. As you say, there has been uh, land reform and in particular agricultural land reform in other uh, parts of the world. It, it is possible for this to occur. But, um, you know, um, folks in the United States, um, you know, labor under this impression of their exceptionalism, you know, that it is a, a unique country. And I don't deny that in many ways it, it has been a unique country. It's not as exceptional as most people in the United States believe themselves uh, to be. And let me uh, point out something that occurred in the very early stages of the development of the, the nation, a period of time when a very small number of intellectuals were actually laying out what would be the basic precepts of how the nation was going to operate. You know, one of the very few times where a single generation of folks actually did get to operate on a blank slate and essentially lay out the way that a nation was going to operate. Um, Thomas Jefferson did not believe in the right to own land in perpetuity. Uh, there is an established record of correspondence between him and particularly James Madison, where they hashed this out. Uh, Thomas Jefferson believed that land should be redistributed every generation. He just thought it was inherently unfair that if you came into a piece of land, then that land was retained forever just within your lineage, because then what happens to other people? And that's the world we're living in right now. So he lost out on that, that argument. But that, that idea of um, the counter to, to that idea, uh, which generally is referred to as usufruct, is the idea that the land should actually be in the hands of people who can give it use with any given generation, and then generations should hand off to one another, but not in the sense of owning the land. And so, uh, you know, there, there actually is some established rationale to talk about how the fact that land because of the fact that it is part of the earth system uh, and because land use is actually one of the most effective ways that we know to get to a climate stable future in other words by putting land into perennial vegetation as much as possible that that's actually the public interest it's the best use of land it's the best investment that we could all make collectively so um what i keep what I mean when I keep repeating the notion that we deserve a 21st century food system, I mean that it should correspond to the knowledge that we have in the 21st century, but also that we deserve it because we're paying for it. So rather than, you know, self-interested industrialists uh, essentially scamming the rest of the country for their exclusive benefit, we should actually be able to make the straight-faced argument there is a better food system that we can put together. It would be better for the environment. It would be better for eaters. It would be better for everyone and for some industrialists. I mean, they're part of society. Uh, it's just that the system is not all about them and they should not tell us what is better for everyone on the basis of their interests. We really should consider, you know, the general public interest. So, you know, anytime you can quote Thomas Jefferson, uh, you know, you have a good leg up in, in an argument. So so I, I don't give up complete hope that land reform is possible because when you go back to, you know, the whole myths of the, quote, founding farmers, or you know, he was one of the founding farmers, but founding fathers, uh, and, you know, the supposed sanctity of their, their views, there's some pretty powerful voices from the origin story of the U.S. that actually wanted to see a completely different way of uh, managing land. I I also think in the modern context, it's compelling to to pin together the social support needs of retiring landowners with the social support needs of beginning farmers, and that if there were holistic attention to supporting both of those groups in a transition sense, absent that piece, uh, there's a lot of dead ends, but when you when you add that into it, there's both the sort of practical transition uh, superstructure as well as the opportunity potentially to appeal to a wider uh, sense of political will of this is you know something that we're doing for the benefit of our our fellow citizens sort of thing and the generations um, you know retiring and, and coming into our 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 working age class. 
Absent any further questions here, Ricardo, any, any closing thoughts that, that you'd like to share with us before we part? Well, I'll just repeat so that you know that I truly mean it. I, I can't tell you how much I admire the work that you folks are leading, the different sets of people that you're bringing together. Um, I want to repeat, I'm really invested in what you're doing and want to see you succeed. So any way that we can support you, you know, you can count on. Uh, it also is really good to um, be able to see the list of people uh, that were here. Thanks for the opportunity to be connected to the Midwest again, uh, even virtually. I truly appreciate it. You've been listening to Perennial AF, the Savannah Institute's podcast about agroforestry and perennial agriculture. A big thank you to Dr. Ricardo Salvador for headlining our 2022 Perennial Farm Gathering. We're hoping to have other recordings from the most recent PFG out soon on the podcast too. Just a reminder that if you attended the most recent PFG, you have free access to the recordings from all of the sessions on our website. You can also purchase access to some of our past online gatherings and conferences and view those session recordings even if you didn't attend. Do it now while it's still dark and cold outside. I know you're not gonna be watching them in May. Send us a message if there's a specific speaker you'd really like to hear on the podcast, or if you have a question you'd like to ask or a story you'd like to tell. You can leave us a voicemail or send us a message on social media at Savannah Institute, and it'll find its way to me. That's Savannah with no H, two N's, three A's, and an S but the order is up to you. If you want to get our newest episodes when they come out, go ahead and hit the subscribe button. And if you're really feeling inspired and want to help us out, you can rate this podcast and write a review. It only takes a second, and it really helps this podcast get heard by more people. That's it for me. Keep up the good work out there, take lots of breaks, and keep it perennial AF. Want to see a future that's perennial AF? If you're listening to this podcast, there's a good chance you're already taking steps to make that happen. But did you know you don't have to be a farmer or a researcher to make a big AF impact on climate change? Here at the Savannah Institute, we lay the groundwork for widespread agroforestry throughout the Midwest, conducting the research, education, and outreach necessary to transform agriculture and combat climate change. But we can't do this alone. Even with a rock star lineup of tree crop breeders and community agroforesters and technical service providers, transformative change requires a community of people working together, and we need you. Becoming a monthly donor is one of the best ways to be a part of the transformation and affect positive change for our climate. Visit our website at savannahinstitute.org give to learn more.